I want to welcome everyone to this session. Uh, my name is Hirag Vartanyan. I'm the moderator. I'm also the editor-in-chief and co-founder of Hyperallergic. And uh, thank you everyone for coming to this session. Um, this session is called Craft for Care and Well-Being. And um, I will be joined by our three guests shortly. Um, but first, I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of uh, the series. Uh, today is the first of, a, of three panels that will be taking place in the next month. Um, and I will be moderating those. Um, and we think this will be a great opportunity for people to start thinking about design at, at, this, at this particular time in this particular crisis and what it means for craft thinking and how, how we can use it to respond to COVID-19 and the coronavirus. And also particularly, there's an emphasis today, we'll be talking about how craft, um, how we can use it to solve social issues or at least you know, really grapple with them in a serious way. So um, we will be joined uh, shortly, but I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody. And I'm going to ask Scott Pollack to um, join us just to uh, introduce some of our sponsors and then we'll continue with that. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Rog. This is wonderful. Happy Friday, everybody. We made it to the end of the week, yet another week. And I appreciate everybody's patience as we work our, ourselves um, out of this isolation. Um, so it's been a great opportunity. I'm um, Scott Pollack, the Director of um, Engagement and Public Programs at the American Craft Council. And we're super fortunate to have everybody on the line. Um, really want to be um, uh, thankful, of, of course, Harag, for all the work that we've done with uh, the collaborators on this project. We have a three-part series here that's being presented um, alongside Hyperallergic and what you're all up to. Thank you. Um, we also have the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, who's been feeding us incredible content and speaker ideas, as well as the Critical Craft Forum and the Socially Engaged Craft Collective. Um, so a big shout out to all of our collaborating partners as we've been able to pull these conversations together. Um, I also want to acknowledge the, um, uh, the, uh, the fun side of meeting on a Friday afternoon is it feels like a virtual happy hour moment here. We brought in some really great partners, the Shoots and Roots Bitters team. Um, they have been providing us with a, a, a concoction, a cocktail each week here that is sort of supporting and uplifting this theme as a way to just to get add some making into this whole um, heady moment uh, that, 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 that we're in right now. So thank you Shoots and Roots Bitters for this incredible, I think we've got uh, a strawberry shrub today going on and I, I will say I'm happy to participate in that. Um, so without further ado, we are going to be opening up each of these sessions by giving some space to um, our collaborating partners who have been helping us pull this together. So I want to turn it over and welcome in um, Anna Metcalf, um, who is one of the members of the Social Engaged Craft Collective to introduce um, that team and the work that they're doing. Anna, thanks so much. Thank you, Scott, and um, thank you so much for inviting um, the collective, Social Engaged Craft Collective, to join us, um, to join you all today, um, and for bringing all of these amazing partners and people together. Um, I'm going to screen share our collective website really quickly. Um, so I'm going to go, I'm actually going to go all the way down to the bottom. So this is the Socially Engaged Craft Collective's website. Um, and I'm pulling you down to the bottom because um, there's some really great images of some of the work that we've been doing recently. Um, so I'm a member of the Socially Engaged Craft Collective. Um, <laughs> and while that might seem like a mouthful, the SECC is a group of artists who create um, a broad range of socially engaged projects that are all rooted in the history of craft objects and craft materials. Uh, we see engagement and inclusion as being uh, truly endemic to craft practices. Um, and our goals as a collective are to connect with each other um, in our common values and also to expose other artists and educators to the collaborative and socially engaged aspects of craft. Um, as a collective, the SECC is really, we're really honored to be here today and also um, to be a part of the ideation for this uh, confluence of ideas and values and practices. Um, I just really quickly want to introduce you to one of the ways in which our collective has um, responded to the pandemic, um, and that is essentially to create and host opportunities for engagement through our own Zoom channel. Um, and that's what you're seeing on the screen right now, which is um, a couple of our past uh, conversations. Um, and we, we're recognizing that while we're socially distanced, we all still really crave engagement. 
Um, and so we created what we're calling the Virtual Art Center. Um, for about six weeks now, we've hosted Zoom meetups that connect us to each other and offer ideas um, and conversations to anyone who's interested in joining. Um, the themes that we're primarily focusing on are, uh, are teaching, talking, and playing, although uh, we're interested in all uh, versions of that. Um, and many of our collective members have hosted these conversations, but we're also welcoming submissions from all corners of the craft world. So if any of you, our participants, are interested in a topic and want to talk, we're here for you. Um, and as a part of the Visual Art Center, so I'm just scrolling up to um, May 20th, Wednesday, May 20th, um, the SVCC will be hosting three public dialogues following each of the ACC forum conversations. Um, these recap dialogues are open to the public and will allow continued conversation in a moderated format, um, but they will be open conversations. Um, so please join us to unpack and elaborate on any of the ideas that were really inspiring to you today. Um, and we will post the Zoom link um, in the uh, chat thread as well as the website to um, see more of the socially engaged um, Craft Collective Virtual Art Center. Um, and with that, um, I am going to pass it back to Rog, I believe. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Anna. So as you can tell um, uh, from our schedule, we're going to be ta tackling three different uh, topics. And at the beginning of each of those topics, we're going to be showing a short video followed by the speaker who will do a short presentation um, as well as uh, discuss a little bit about their work. So our first um, short film is um, uh, it's part of the Not in Isolation film project. And it's, um, it, it, it features I'm sorry, I just have to pull this up for a second. Uh, Jordan Carey of Loquat Design, Portland, Maine, and was produced in collaboration with Indigo Arts Alliance, um, which is an organization committed to ensuring the voices of black and brown artists that are, uh, are immune from erasure during this pandemic. So we're gonna start by showing that, and then we'll be followed shortly after by Stephanie Sihuku, who will be joining us to talk about her work. My name is Jordan Carey and I'm here today to talk about Low Quad and how we're dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. What Low Quad is doing and what, what we're doing with the Low Quad project in this pandemic is kind of the same thing that we've been doing, which is, you know, as a brand, try to create objects, you know, fashion accessories for people that are going to be fun and do it in a way that hopefully reduces you know suffering in a in a holistic way in any direction that we can i mean that's really what we're we're aiming for you know and that's what we've done with our choice of materials whether it's like you know plant-based leather alternatives and upcycled leather cotton instead of plastic as much as possible the motifs and the clothing we create with the purpose of empowering people who have been disenfranchised or stepped on, whatever the case may be. Since that was our frame of mind for Low Quad already, you know, it was kind of a natural progression into making these particular masks to fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. We wanted these masks to be fun and to be a way for people to sort of get excited about you know, doing the right thing, which is covering themselves and being very careful and contributing to ways for for makers like me and for makers like us to survive and also make masks for people who are on the front lines. They really need our help and they really need your help. And so, you know, for me to be in this position where I'm still finding opportunities to self-actualize and and you know get excited about getting up and and making and and hopefully offering that to people who are consuming this work and then also offer that to people on the front lines is, is really a great position to be in and I'm, I'm so grateful so thank you <laughs>
Great. Thank you so much. So Stephanie, you have the floor. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here and also to be discussing recent developments in what the craft artists and community is doing in response to COVID-19. So um, what I decided to do is put together a couple images that I'm gonna talk through um, and in a way share some of the recent developments in my studio. So I am a fine arts, uh, a fine artist and educator. And since uh, the uh, pandemic hit, unfortunately I've been uh, shut out of my art studio. Um, the way that I've pivoted has actually been to make masks full time. So for the past eight weeks, I set upon um, the idea of joining a lot of uh, different makers throughout the, the world now in terms of thinking about how to respond and produce things you know, from my home studio. So what I'm showing this large image is um, a series of masks. I've made over about 800 already. And what they are made out of is a green screen chroma key fabric. It's actually a fabric that I use for my um, art installations. And a little bit of background too about the kind of work that I do. Um, it, there is a political bent to it. So in 2017, I was working on a, a community and collaborative protest banner making workshops. And you know, from there, the experience of you know, joining forces with other people to create uh, productive things in response to both politics and social issues is something that I've actually kind of absorbed um, in terms of my interests and my art making. And then also as a fine artist who does delve into some pretty intense craft uh, processes, including textiles and sewing, um, you know, my own artwork has lent itself to having a pretty strong knowledge base with my hands. So, you know, these are examples of um, other artworks that I've done recently. This was from 2018 at the Renwick Gallery at the Smithsonian. And it's literally the same fabric that I've been making the masks has come from these installations. And another thing that I wanted to talk about too is that, you know, when, when the need for masks really came up very, very quickly, it was the online craft community that stepped up to respond. And you know, there were a lot of exchanges online about what types of, uh, you know, what designs to make, what styles were the best to produce, and also what was the most expedient. And it was amazing to see this kind of exchange of information. And so, you know, along with prototyping with others, you know, different methods and, and varieties to make, you know, I've settled on a couple uh, versions that I think have been, you know, quite useful. And so over the course of the last eight weeks, and you know, this is a shot of my tiny home office desk because I don't have access to my art studio. I've been able to make over 800 and they've been all sent out and donated to nonprofit organizations, um, shelters, food banks, and frontline workers who can't otherwise afford it. So I make my masks purely for donation and that's because I have um, you know, I, I actually feel like I am economically secure and so I'm going to use this time to then assist others who aren't. And it's been interesting too to see these masks out in the world by, you know, uh, by workers and colleagues and it turns out that a green screen mask also uh, it becomes a, uh, a digital green screen in Zoom, which is kind of interesting. And then eventually I ran out of the green screen fabric. So I'm, I'm using, you know, my fabric stash from years of accumulated uh, craft projects and artworks. So um, yeah, that's just a, a general uh, framework. And I'd love to talk to Harag about if there's any questions or things we can discuss. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the, the, first of all, the decision to use green screen at first and, and what was, what was the thinking like? And what, did you, did you, secretly hope people would start playing with it visually? <laughs> so, you know, honestly, it was literally because that was the massive amount of material I had. So, you know, the, the initial idea was that this was going to be artwork, that I would be, uh, you know, it would be material for an art installation uh, that had been planned months in advance. And without that opportunity, it just made perfect sense. You know, it, there it was. And what's fascinating now too, is that there's a huge run on cotton fabric, on elastic, on all the basic materials that we sort of took for granted in the very beginning. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've talked to a number of people that said the elastics have disappeared. 
there's almost like so many sizes there that, that have just there is there's no possibility so now what would you uh what what was the biggest sort of surprise in terms of what you discovered creating this project because i mean you created 800 masks and you've distributed this what did you wish you knew before you started um that would have helped you maybe um do this a, a little bit more efficiently or i don't know how you want to characterize that yeah, well, you know, in, in the very beginning, the entire production system of mask making, and this is throughout the country, it was not ready. It wasn't ready for the demand. You know, the, the facilities and the labor pool wasn't set up to do so. And volunteers were basically being called up to meet this demand. And um, I, I think that uh, even though the situation is still dire and masks are still very much needed, it felt incredibly desperate in the beginning. And so, you know, with all the communication happening across makers to get the right types of prototypes out into the world, it felt very collaborative. Um, it also felt like, you know, a, a, an emergency response that I don't think any of us, you know, had collectively dealt with. Right. We're, we're getting some interesting comments. It seems a lot of people have been involved in making masks themselves. And someone made the suggestion that shoelaces work great, too. So that's a good suggestion for those who want to go with that. But someone also asked about the fiber content of the green screen fabric. Oh, yeah, it's 100 percent cotton. So it's a um, yeah, I, I make sure or with the research, the basic research that I've been able to do. And the thing, too, is that there's conflicting um, uh, sort of reports on, you know, ways of making them and what is the best kind of design. So it's a very, uh, I, I don't want to say it's subjective, but there are many models out there and they work with different effects, really. So now, how, have you felt, have you felt this sort of like the craft community, really, you mentioned of how so many people in the, a little bit, but have you felt the camaraderie around this? Have you felt it in terms of you creating it yourself, and then the other people who have been making it and sort of sharing all those little things? Has that really come out? Well, there's definitely um, a really robust online exchange and community, and there's a ton of Facebook groups, and there's, you know, a lot of like, you know, large groups and small ones, but What's been interesting for me to process is there seems to be a divide right now between this notion of free or donated labor versus um, people needing to charge, you know, for, to, to uh, be compensated for the mass making. And I am fully behind the idea that labor needs to be compensated. You know, the fact that we are having to muster and volunteer our efforts and materials and time to meet the needs of an entire country that has been disinvested in terms of the federal government's, um, you know, uh, focus on healthcare. I don't think, as much as I'm heartened by the community sort of, you know, engagement of this problem, I feel like it was an avoidable problem. And I wish that more could be uh, discussed in terms of the politics of why craftspeople have been asked to step in for free. Right. I mean, that, that is such a great point, because I think particularly a lot of people are concerned um, about that because people need to sustain their lives, of course. And I wanted to say how, how really attractive the masks you're making are, too. So I just appreciate, you know, the, there's so many different um, craftspeople and artists creating these types of uh, things all around. And I just want to sort of say kudos for that. Now, is there something you wish you could make or the, the, like some part of this project that you felt was maybe outside of your skill set that ideally you'd love to partner with someone in order to achieve? Oh, well, I, I was pretty lucky in the sense that a couple of weeks ago I was, I was approached by a small scale, um, uh, a small artist uh, run uh, production business called Open Editions in San Francisco. And they approached me to use some of my pattern designs uh, to print onto masks in which they could then produce bulk and volume and sell it to the public in exchange for, for every mask they would sell, they would be able to donate one to a nonprofit organization that couldn't otherwise afford it. So for, you know, they do 400, uh, 400 masks to sell, 400 to donate, and they keep shifting that in cycles. And so with that, I think, uh, you know, that type of scale has uh, affected, you know, the ability for more people to get these masks and not rely on the volunteer system. The other good thing is that these, uh, th this company, Open Editions, is employing out-of-work 
uh, immigrant women who would ordinarily work in a sewing factory and whose jobs have recently been shuttered because of the, um, you know, the shelter in place order. So, you know, the, this sort of cycle of compensation as well as donation and um, productivity, it's really nice to think holistically about how these support systems can actually support everyone and not just take from people. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question from McKelly who's asking if you anticipate that you offer your masks for sale to public at some point. Yeah, I, um, I've been asked that actually. And honestly, um, because I think I'd like to focus all my time to, you know, create the, the masks for donation. You know, if someone can purchase my quote unquote pattern design masks on, you know, from open editions. But no, um, I did sell, I did have a, a fundraiser in which I sold pairs of them very, very briefly. And I was able to actually raise about $3,000 to help a nonprofit organization in the Philippines um, supply protective gear. That's fantastic. Now, could you give some advice for people who maybe, maybe, may be thinking about doing this or making masks themselves in terms of distributing them? Like what were the most useful ways? Were hospitals very receptive? Were there other ways to make sure these masks were getting to the right people? Yeah, that's a really good question because um, right now the demand is still really high. And um, in the very beginning, hospital workers were not requesting um, homemade fabric masks because they were technically not, you know, protective, uh, proper protective gear. Now things have shifted a little bit more. And what I would just suggest to people is you can start very, very local. Like you can literally just, you know, uh, your neighbors, your local community, your nonprofit organizations, food banks, and, you know, you can scale it up if you want. There's also a national uh, calls for masks. So the Navajo Nation has been needing masks. And, you know, there's a, a um, you can, I think there's so many outlets right now. And there's so much need that you, you will not, if you're interested in making masks, there is, um, uh, it, it is a broad field. Absolutely. And how about, and uh, in terms of, uh, I, I just want to sort of piggyback on what you were saying. It's like, it's really interesting how so many of these networks have sort of formed and often during these times of crisis, they form and then they sort of like, they continue post crisis. Now I'm wondering if there are any signs of any of these, like, is, how is this impacting your own practice and what you do? And is this something that you hope maybe to do again in the future or post pandemic? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, uh, coming into this, there was a large portion of my uh, professional artistic life that was involved in social practice projects that did create networks already. So I feel like, you know, coming into it, I did have a, um, a propensity to, you know, create connections and networks among people. But I think what's more surprising now is that, um, you know, on a much more grassroots level and, you know, thinking too about that aid and support and, um, and community isn't just, um, you know, something that exists online, you know, but is a, uh, is, you know, your, your literal neighbor next door and, you know, the folks that come in and out of your life, delivery people, you know, the, this, this network of not just say friends or people in a like-minded space, but that, you know, us as a society, like our, you know, everybody who's in it is, is um, must be taken care of. And I think, you know, that's a, um, it, it's just risen to the, um, to the front. Yeah, I think a number of the questions uh, in, that we've also received and something I've been thinking about is how gendered some of this has become like most almost I don't think I know any male mask makers, even though I know that they exist and they're there, but the majority are certainly uh, have been women. What do you think about that? And, you know, and, and, you know, particularly because, you know, at the same time, of course, this is important, it's a public good, but, you know, there is this kind of divide that still exists, even something as simple as mask making. Any thoughts? Yeah, <laughs> big thoughts. I mean, it, it is, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, you're right, you know, the, the majority of the people I seem to um, either encounter or observe in this process are, um, you know, female identified. There are definitely, you know, uh, men, male identified artists uh, and craft people involved. But I, what's been surprising is that, um, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's obviously, a, I think it's skill sets, right? So textile work and sewing is traditionally seen as a, you know, a domestic or even female craft endeavor. But um, the notion too, that female labor 
should be um, less compensated or is uh, worthy of being, you know, volunteered as opposed to compensated, that is incredibly gendered also. And I have a feeling that if this was an, another field in which, um, you know, uh, engineering or, you know, some other uh, form not textiles related was, uh, you know, was was uh, uh, spotlighted that it would not be expected that this is just something that can be given away. Right. I, I guess I, I, it's a, such a good point. If it was ventilator makers, you'd you'd assume that there probably might be more men than than women. But a number of people in the comments have mentioned that certainly there are men making masks, and we don't want to uh, you know say there aren't. There certainly are. But I think we're just sort of uh, mentioning that there there seems to be uh, certainly more women. Um, creating these, or at least uh, from what we've been seeing. So thank you so much, Stephanie. I think that was really, really great. And I think um, if, it, you know, it's uh, kudos, I think really this was an example of like the arts community really shining and being able to sort of bring their skills to the table to help everyone. So thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you, Hrag. It's been great to be here. Great. So we're going to continue on to our next, um, our next video and uh, speaker. Um, the speaker is Karen Hampton, who will um, start uh, shortly after the video. And she uh, will be speaking specifically about how we can use craft to sort of identify and also just grapple with social issues. Um, so the video we're going to be watching first is uh, about Kay and Molly Textiles, which is a, 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 an organization out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's a social ent enterprise business that's uh, located near the International District of Albuquerque and committed to creating good, good jobs for immigrants and refugees in their community. So let's start. Hi, I'm Molly Luti. Hi, I am Kay Suzuki. And I'm part of Kay and Molly Textiles. This is a social enterprise that we started to create good jobs for refugees and immigrants about 10 years ago. One of the things that we did when we knew that we were going to have to close was make a calculation for our staff to see that they would be well taken care of. We did lay off our staff at the end of March when we had to close our studio. We were able to give them a severance check to carry them over and to time out when the $1,200 would come in, when um, the UI benefits would kick in, and then the extra $600. So we feel confident that our staff will be taken care of. Before COVID-19, uh, most of our business was uh, wholesale accounts from small shops across the country. That, of course, changed when most of the small shops closed down. And um, we now are dependent on our online store. So we switched all of our inventory onto our online store. And now we're receiving orders from people all over the country that are supporting small businesses. And we're very grateful for that, that input and that support. So Molly mentioned that most of our business has gone online, um, but every day we do get calls from people asking us whether we make face masks. We are a screen printing company and so we're not set up for sewing uh, on a production level and all our staff is laid off at this time. So what we did was create a face mask sewing kit and um, people can order the kits or they just can follow the instructions that we have on our website on how to sew a face mask at home with our dish towels. Um, in the community, we get asked almost daily uh, for donations of our flower sack dish towel so that people can make um, face masks for health care workers or you know people in need. Um, and so I think to date, we've donated close to 500 um, dish towels or sold them at very reduced rates so that people can um, use the material to make face masks for for the community. So to be able to make the kits available and as well uh, the instructions online I think has been our way to contribute to this real community spirit of helping our healthcare workers. The artisan community has been greatly affected by COVID-19. Um, this is the time of year when markets open and when craft fairs happen and of course all of those have been cancelled. So we've seen many of our friends go online and in some cases that's worked very well, in other cases it's been more difficult. 
uh, but this city has been incredibly supportive and we're very grateful to live in a town where the city supports the artisan, the creative community. After this pandemic subsides, I really hope that we learn the lesson that we are connected, not just locally, but globally. There are just a lot of things that I think we've learned or are learning through this pandemic that shows us that people are willing to help each other. And I hope that's one of the big lessons we learn going forward. When the pandemic subsides, I really hope that our staff will come back. Kay and I miss our staff and our lunches together and working together as a team. So I hope they'll all be able to come back and that the orders will come in and that we can get back to some kind of normalcy. We'll have to be creative in the way we go forward, but we're optimistic. Hi. Okay. Apologies. There seemed to be a little bit of a glitch there. Um, one thing I like, really enjoyed about that video uh, was particularly the fact that now so many of these stories about small businesses, including us at Hyperallergic, are about grappling with the issues that something like COVID-19 uh, faces. So I really appreciate uh, a small business like, uh, like theirs really sort of being open about what they're doing. Um, with that. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Karen Hampton, uh, uh, an accomplished and uh, very talented uh, weaver and fiber artist, to uh, present some of her work. Hello. Am I... Hello? You are on, Karen. Oh, hi. Um, I'm just not seeing myself yet. Um, hello. I am a mixed media um, fiber artist and I produce my work from the, um, from the perspective that is to be alive is a political act. And I, I'm sorry, I can't see, I can't. Karen, is there a setting at the top of the screen that says hide self view that you can unclick? At the top of no, um, I'm terribly sorry. We can see you. You are on camera, oh, okay. and, and your sound okay, is coming it, through. Okay, then I'll just I'll just go with it. Um, that I I produce my work from the perspective that to be alive is a political act. Um, my artwork is a merger of um, is a merger of my politics with my art. I'm going to share my screen, hopefully, um, with you, and we'll start talking about some work. Um, can you see my, my screen? Yes, we can. OK, OK. So this piece is Troubled Times. This was a piece that I made, um, I made right after the last presidential election. The piece was inspired by um, a residency that I did in 2014 in, um, in Northern Nevada. And during that time I visited um, one of the largest petroglyph sites. And it's a petroglyph site, so um, with rock drawings that, that, are, that date back to 10 and 12,000 years ago. And when I was there, I kept thinking about the ancients and what, who were their gods? What, did, what were their beliefs at that point? And I went back and I visited that again later after the election. And I, you know, when I and many other people were feeling so disillusioned 
And I went back to their, that place and I started thinking about, okay, what, um, what would the ancients have to say? Because, you know, we're drinking the same water that they had. It's a little more polluted. Um, and we're, um, we're breathing the same air that they had. So I just started really going into that place and using, using materials. Um, I used raffia cloth. I used um, pigments as my paint, my original paint. And then I went over it and dyed it in indigo and then with other mediums and stitching. But really addressing and thinking about, thinking about the ancients. Um, oh, now it's it going to work? Maybe it's going to work. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I would recommend hit the play from current slide button okay. near the top, and then you should oh. be able to page down through them. Okay, now I think I can do it. Okay. Um, this piece is The Dancer, and this was from a residency in Brazil where I was looking at who the abolitionists were and what was the culture um, that brought about, that really was the mix of two different, you know, because Brazil is believed to be the most Catholic of all countries. And yet at the same time, it's a, it's a place where at the same time, um, the African-based religions are still practiced and respected within the Catholic church and vice versa. And so I was thinking about out of, out of the past into the present and thinking about the capoeira dancer as being one of the symbols of a man um, abolitionist. Karen, I, I'm so sorry. I, I don't mean to interrupt. I yeah. believe we're, we're still only seeing the one window oh, no. from the PowerPoint. Oh. I, I just need to ask you to go to the share screen button near the bottom. You may need to stop your share and then okay. share it on the, the slideshow that had come up, which is technically a different window. Okay, so, okay, so I went back. I'm so sorry. Oh. Um, okay, so I'm there and go back to the share screen again. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, and Okay, I'm just gonna jump to this one. Can, um, can you see this image? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Okay, okay, so this is a walk with the ancestors. And so my work is very much historically based. And in this case, this was, I used images from inside the plantation where my maternal ancestors were um, enslaved. And this was inside the greenhouse because it's the largest standing greenhouse in North America. Um, I think in the Eastern, Eastern coast. And, um, and I have all the stories from many stories about my ancestor escaping from internment and um and i tried to imagine what life was like there so i'm tell me if you can see if i click on this one can you see this image yes this image? It's visible. Okay. okay so this is the dancer that i was speaking about before with brazil Okay, so now I'm just gonna try to hopefully get out of. Oh, come on. Let me in to stop share. Um, Karen, do you want, are you, do you have more to continue or? No, I no, no, I just was gonna go take it out of, okay. take it out of um, share. No problem. 
Yes. So thank you for that. And it seems like you have a number of fans in the comments, which is always great to see. So that's, that's really wonderful. You know, when we were talking and preparing um, for this panel, one of the things you mentioned to me, Karen, that I, I'm, I'm just dying to ask you about is we were talking about images of the coronavirus and COVID-19 and how you were saying that you disliked so many of the images that are being circulated and are out. And I'm curious if you want to explain why, why that is. I, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I guess I keep seeing the scientific image that, you know, is, and I just feel like, you know, that really what we need to be doing is really using our own imaginations and having our own feelings as to what, what this virus is and really having and really going into a whole thought process of, um, of really changing the dynamics of it. So does that, does that mean that you're still looking for the right image or do you feel like this is the job of artists and craftspeople to literally make those images? That are I think it's, that's what I think it is. I really think that it's, that this is the time for the artists and the craftspeople to start, to start changing the narrative. So any idea of how you'd like to change the narrative? Um, I'm actually, I'm working on a piece right now and, and while it began, uh, maybe a couple years ago, and I didn't know where it was coming from. It was very different than my work, what um, normally is. And that new piece has just, it, it really feels like it is like a seed exploding. Mm. And that it is, and I don't know that that is the virus, but maybe I really think that it is the people exploding and really growth and regrowth. Mm -hmm. So now, how have you seen your own process change as a result of this crisis? You know, I, have, have you been spending more time weaving? Have you been spending more time sort of doing research? How has it impacted that? Um, at first, well, in, in early March, I believe, I got a text message from my son and it said, I think it's time to start making masks now because my daughter-in-law is a nurse at the hospital um, in Washington state that had the first cases. And I just like whipped into gear and began and started thinking and started feeling very much what Stephanie was speaking about um, and the video was speaking about that it's really, you know, the galvanizing of the forces and really um, um, taking an action. And so one of the things that I did at that point was, because I was really thinking about how was I gonna teach my students, was really to bring it into the classroom and to, you know, and to challenge them to start making masks. You know, that, that I didn't care who they gave their masks to, but it was the act that, you know, really going back to that place to be alive as a political act. Right. So one of the things you also, when we were talking about your work uh, before this panel, one of the things, words you brought up was subversive. You know, mm -hmm. how sometimes the images can be very subversive. In a crisis like this, how do you see that tendency to subvert? How do you see that play out? Or how do you hope it could add to the bigger conversation? Well, I really think that it's up to, you know, very much sits in the hands of artists to rewrite the script, to really, to really challenge things by, by looking at it and having, creating a, a different worldview. We're endowed with this, with um, a lot of creative energy. And that it's really that creative energy that where new growth can come from. You know, I think that this is a challenge. This is a time for us to dream about the future, making a more equitable future, um, really bringing people together, building community, and, and, and really enhancing beauty. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much, Karen. Really appreciate that. So with that, we're going to move on to our third topic, um, which is what role, what roles will craft play beyond this current humanitarian crisis to help us heal and to mend? 
So um, we're going to begin with a video by uh, Avra Messe, frontline healthcare worker from Brooklyn, who tapped into her ceramic and craft thinking skills to tackle the outbreak in a critical care unit with her colleagues. So we're going to start with, by that. Hi, I'm Avra Messe. I'm a ceramic artist. I fell in love with clay when I was 16. I took a ceramics class at Hartford Art School and I never looked back. I got a BFA and an MFA in ceramics. So I am currently in my last semester of nursing school. And because of the pandemic, uh, I was hired in the hospitals as a nurse tech. In nursing school, I realized that there's such a relationship between being in my studio as an artist and working as a nurse. There's, there are the tools for one. Like it's really important. I work with my hands all the time in my studio and I use tools and there's, you have to become familiar with them and it becomes second nature to you. And then there's the finesse level and you learn the technical skills and then you memorize it your hands memorize it and then you just feel it and I, I think that's the same in art when you're making. As I walk into the hospital there are chalk drawings on the ground and I don't know who's done them but they're the rainbow that's the rainbow is a sign of support for uh, first line workers. So I'm working in the hospital five days five shifts a week right now and it's great and it's scary and I have a low level of panic every second of the shift and every time I walk into a room. We're not supposed to stay in the rooms for very long because it, it increases our risk of exposure, but it is so hard to, to leave these patients alone. So I find myself going in often, but for short spurts, just so that they know someone is there and someone cares. I have to do something with how I feel and what I've seen. And um, one of the things I've started doing, I've been starting to make um, bowls and cups in my studio, cups that have the rainbow on it that I plan on giving out once I get through the firing process. The other thing that shows support in bowls that have little, uh, little images from our corona pandemic quarantine days. The other thing I have been doing is sewing masks. I have no formal skills in sewing. I've just taught myself. I like the idea of just being able to give to my community and my neighbors. They're, they're higher risk because they're older um, and I want them to be protected as well. It just makes it feel like we're all in this together more than anything else. I feel really grateful that I can both work in a hospital and have an impact on what's happening right now and help patients get through some of the scariest times. And I also feel grateful that I can go downstairs and hide in my studio. It's a really nice escape right now. Great. Okay. Having trouble. There it is. Great. Thank you so much. Um, great. So next we have Holly Hanesian, who will be talking about her various projects that specifically have to do with the, the topic of touch. So Holly, you have the floor. Thanks, Parag. I'm going to be showing um, some images and some work about an earlier project I did, um, which deals with some of these ceramic objects that I would make with people. I'm going to show you one now. And this is basically what I'm going to end the conversation with. But first, I'm going to um, start with um, just showing you a few images. And I will start here. So um, these 
are, let's see, let me go to the beginning. All right. <coughs> Okay, so here we are. Um, Holly, we are still seeing your camera and not your screen. Oh, okay. Let me go back. I think I am need to share my screen. Let's see if this helps. There we are. We see it now. Okay, Thank you. great. Thank you. And are you sharing? Okay. So um, I don't know if you're seeing... Let's see, here we go. Um, so I'm gonna start here. This is, um, these are images of people who have been holding other people's hands with clay in it. And the beginning of this project began when about five or six years ago, when I was walking around campus, I teach at Florida State University, and I saw students really not engaging with each other, but really just engaging with their phones. And to me, it seemed like a tremendous loss of um, this ability of, of touch, um, especially as a, somebody who works in ceramics and I just love working with a material. Um, so basically, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this project and um, then I'm gonna end with these self-soothing stones that I showed you at the very beginning. So um, part of this project is I went around the country and I asked people to hold hands with myself or another person and, and just really sort of squeeze the material and then actually relax and just be with one another. And part of that act of doing that was this shared space that, that felt sort of part performance and a little durational and at times physically draining. But it, after um, spending time with one another, um, there was this beautiful handshake that emerged from our hands. And these eventually got fired. And I was really sort of um, thinking about what happens during the handshake and, and really what happens when we touch another person or touch our skin upon a material. And we get a lot of, of um, substantial... Uh, I'm over Miss A. I'm Mr. Oh, we get a lot of... Um, Every second of the show. Hmm, I'm not sure what, where that's coming from, but... Um, I'm just gonna keep moving on and um, talk a little bit about the fact that oxytocin would take place at times when I did hold hands with people. And oxytocin is that feeling good hormone that happens. And I think it's one of the things that right now it's really important for us um, during the pandemic to have that moment where we're either cuddling with our pets or hugging a person. And if we're living alone in social isolation, we're not having that. So during this process of this project, I realized that touching and where it takes place in the brain was, was a pretty important experience. And um, as part of this project, I did work with um, a neuroscientist to find out where touch took place in the brain. Um, and I'm gonna just sort of show you the end of the project, which resulted in all these handshakes and um, were put in an installation and, uh, from there, um, they were used in different manners. And, um, and then I'm gonna, um, this is the other project in between that I'm gonna sort of cycle back to the original self-soothing stones. But I think the idea of using your senses during this time is so important. And this project was actually a time where the visual sense was not nearly as important, but feeling, feeling through your hands and through smelling and through temperature. So I'm gonna sort of end now by going back to the idea of these self-soothing stones and how so it's so important during a time like this that we have something that we can use to calm ourselves. Um, and like our earlier um, guest on the program, I wanna say that if you're a ceramic artist and you have access to ceramics now, that this is a really wonderful way to, to share in the studio of making a stone and firing it and giving it to other people who are at risk or with people um, who need to have some kind of anxiety uh, way to remove stress from their environment. So um, I'm going to actually now exit the show and... I'm going to 
do that and come back to stop sharing and come back to you, Harad. Great. So. Thanks so much, Holly. So how have people reacted? I mean, have there been any surprising reactions to this kind of thing? Because, you know, touch is one of those things that some people, they might be very sensitive about or they're not mm -hmm. unexpected, particularly around craft or any kind of artistic project where people often are much more comfortable in the role of, of observer. So anything yeah. that you'd like to share? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the things I realized is that uh, part of this project was really sort of observing other people's behavior and creating a social space for someone to walk into and feel comfortable. So my sense, was starting to observe how, how to make people comfortable. And that really is part of the social practice aspect of this where it's just, you're actually creating a moment where you want somebody else to be at ease and you really want somebody to feel comfortable and you want the experience to happen in a way that really benefits them. And so creating those certain environments or those certain moments are really important. I mean, a self-soothing stone is fine because you're gonna use that privately and you don't have to interact with anybody. But when somebody, you're holding hands with somebody, it can be a little uncomfortable if you're an introvert, right? One person I um, held hands with really wanted to do it. He kept circling. And then he told me that he has sweaty hands. So, you know, it. it it, it's different for everybody and each situation, how we encounter each other. It sounds like you're probably learning a lot of, th a lot of things about people that you don't always expect. So. True. <laughs> True. so now, how about in terms of the, um, like, do you see this as a social practice project? I mean, how do you characterize this or how do you frame this for people when you're telling them about it? I do see this as a social practice project because I need to engage with another person for it to actually take place and happen. And not the soothing stone so much, but the, the act of actually reaching out and having a one-to-one -one moment with somebody and holding their hand, that has to happen with another human being. And, you know, I was just reading this section from Annie Al Albers who was talking about, we touch things to assure ourselves of reality and we touch objects that we love. Um, and our tactile experiences are elemental. And right now during a pandemic, touch is so important to us. I mean, it really, it, it really changes the way we feel about our anxiety. And, um, you know, if you have a dog or a, a cat, spending a lot of time even touching them is, is really healing. You know, I, I love the sensitivity of the project. One of the things I, I, I'd love if you talk about a little bit is, so after the process of them creating this object, what happens to that object and how is it sort of treated? How do you know, are, are, do the people themselves, do they sort of ask for, you know, photos of it? I mean, how, what, what have you been finding? Well, I took the, the objects then after they were wet and we took out, we really opened up the hand to look at the objects and then you could see their imprint and my imprint or their imprint and the person that they've held hands with imprint. So that was a sort of magical moment, kind of like back when people used to take a black and white picture and watch it come to life. Um, I took those back and then I fired them in the kiln and then really because I used a very beautiful porcelain clay body and put just a sh little bit of a sheen of glaze on it, they became sort of these really beautiful objects in and of themselves. And, and they were uh, placed in different settings. And I, I really think that now going back to these soothing stones, really giving them to people in this particular moment in time, it's a way for people to have this physical object in their hand and really be able to hold on to something. So it's not even about looking at it, it's just like holding on and knowing it's there in a very elemental, again, way that, that's physically soothing. Uh, three people are asking for the quote, um, uh, for your Annie Albers quote, what book it's coming from. Do you mind sharing that for people who may wanna know? I don't mind at all. It came from this book, Craft, that was, um, it's edited by Tanya Herod and, um, it is on page 27. So great. it's a great, a great book. For those people who want it to know. So now in a project like this, like how do you, have you thought about actually 
like when this project could be revitalized. I mean, at this time, you know, obviously it's not, we're trying to discourage people from shaking hands, but have sure. you given it some thought in terms of like how you would want to maybe reintroduce this, maybe post pandemic? Has there been any thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's come to mind recently in the last couple of years is, which is a little upsetting in a way, is some of the people that I've lost in my life. And I was thinking, I wish I had put a piece of clay in their hand and held their hand at the end of their life. And I really think that this would be a, I mean, it's un, this is an unfortunate time because people are dying and they're not next to their loved ones. And I really think about that, that moment when you want to touch the person who's at the end of their life and how painful that is, but also to have this sort of memory that's a tangible object. Um, and as makers, we esteem objects. They're such an important part of our daily life that I would love to see this live on in that capacity. I mean, I, I was really touched deeply by what you said, because I think particularly for those of us who had loved ones pass away, those last, like, la last grasp of the hands sometimes are the most memorable moments. So even a project like this, I can see, you know, helping people sort of like connect with people that are, that have, have gone away. So mm -hmm. I think that is such a beautiful, beautiful thing, uh, Holly, and I really appreciate that. Now, in terms of if you were to say, one of the things I love to ask makers is, if you had an unlimited budget for this, how would you possibly change it? Or what would you want to add to it in order to sort of augment your idea? I think as an educator and really as an advocate for craft, I would prefer to go out into the world to all the craft organizations and workshops and schools and give them as much clay as possible and say, go out in the world and change the world with social practice by doing whatever you can to engage another person, by holding hands with clay in it, by giving them something that gives somebody a sense of what a material feels like in your hand. And to me, that it's not just about what happens in my life with my practice, but really changing the practice in and of themselves. I love that quote by Theaster Gates, make the thing that makes the thing. And that to me is really what I would, would esteem to do. That's beautiful, I love that. So some people in the comments have mentioned, you know, whether you'd ever think about doing this through gloves, because of course many of us are wearing mm. gloves now and what that would be. And then someone shared, Judy Paolini, uh, shared that she cast her mother's hands and then lost her a few years ago and it's such a precious object for her. So I think Holly, you're really sort of tapping into these sort of emotional connections we have with touch. So mm -hmm. that I think is really powerful. Now, in terms of uh, some of the other makers that you've been looking at in terms of this project, I mean, uh, you just mentioned the Astro Gates, who's always such a good uh, person that, you know, comes up with a lot of great ideas. I'm wondering if there are other makers and how, you know, if there is a community aspect of this within your own making community and your mm -hmm. own colleagues and how that sort of uh, works for you. Sure. Well, I, I am a part of the Socially Engaged Craft Collective, so I give them a shout out for that. And there's a lot of people within that um, group of people that are working directly with other people with ceramics and sharing and collaborating, um, feasting and making and, and working together. I mean, uh, we were also talking about um, in, in Sika, some of the projects that we've done collaborating across the table with people who have brought, made objects and brought them for meals and shared meals and I shared cups of conversation and there's just so many different ways that people can connect through their object making through a real engaged experience and that to me is a way to completely engage one with our senses through food through drinking tea or coffee through a cup through wearing a piece of jewelry that somebody's made specifically for you um, any way where you're really connecting with a group of people and they feel like there's a sense of a visceral sense between what they're holding or making or experiencing um, and creates a human connection, I think is, is such a positive point in our culture right now. That's great. Absolutely. So now I'm going to ask Karen and Stephanie to join us again um, so that we can uh, 
you know, open it up for more broad questions if anyone has. But I have one big question that um, Karen actually, uh, first we were talking about initially, and I, I would love for all of you to sort of answer in your own way, because I think this is also what a lot of us are thinking about is, many of us are saying the arts community is never gonna be the same again, as we've talked about so many different things. Now, how is it going to be different? And what is your own hope for it to be different. And I'm wondering, Karen, if you'd like to start because you were the one who sort of first hit me to this question and was like, that's, you know, this is a great question for a panel like this. So I wonder if you could start. Um, well, I just started really thinking about the fact that so many galleries, so many of the large galleries won't be able to continue or they'll have to shift and make changes because of being closed for so long. And I started thinking about, um, just how, you know, what will really be accessible is really public art and, and really art that is made, you know, in, in, that's really available. And, and really, we're going to need it so much more because this is going to be the period of time when things are going to be really, really difficult, um, what we're coming into. And, you know, and started thinking about um, the WPA, but really how, what does it look like in the future? How can it be really, um, maybe it's more community activated. Okay, I love that. Stephanie, would you like to go next? Yeah, I guess to also follow what Karen was saying, um, you know, the, the notion of um, resources and, you know, this future that in which um, resources might be allocated differently or unfairly. And I think, you know, in our quote unquote normal uh, time, right, where everyone's always saying like, oh, I can't wait for things to get back to normal. But normal was always a problem anyway, in, you know, in terms of like who got access to, you know, uh, the time to make artwork or the time or the support systems to be an artist or a craftsperson. So what I'm really uh, curious about, and of, of course it's both an opportunity, but I think it's also a kind of um, tragic opportunity, is that we're gonna see a shift of resources away from, you know, some of the maybe more progressive or um, newly um, established places that have been given platforms or voices to artists of color, to the undocumented, to all sorts of folks, because there's going to be a kind of circling of the wagons, which is what I'm actually quite fearful of. So I think that what that means, though, is that then it's up to the rest of us, to, to those that can identify this issue and create the, the networks that are in parallel to the institutions, right? Mm -hmm. So if our government or, or our institutions cannot help us or support us, what are we gonna do on a very grassroots level? That's great. Thank you, Stephanie. Holly, um, first of all, someone also wanted you to, uh, is asking to you to reread the Annie Albers quote, because I think everyone really loves that quote. So maybe if you wanna do that a little later or right now, feel free. But I also wanted you to answer this question, if you, if you may. Um, I, I really think that community, going back to what they were both saying, is so important. And I really feel like, um, you know, there's a bartering community, there's a lateral community. I, I really think that, you know, I think of community in so many different ways. And um, in terms of an equitable community, I, it's, it's not been equitable for a while. And I'm not exactly sure how this new disruption is going to, it's going to make things worse. Um, I'm I'm, I'm an educator and I'm really concerned about uh, the ramifications in the next couple of years. I think we have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. And I, I don't even, <laughs> I don't even know where to, where to begin to answer that question. Cause I, I just am really concerned about our culture in general. So I wish I had, I wish I had a, a great answer, but I don't have anything that I feel like I can immediately go to. It. So um, I just want to, I wonder if you, one thing I love to do with these uh, different panels is see if the panelists have any questions for each other. Because all of you guys are the experts, right? You're, you're the ones making, and I mean, you're hearing all these different projects. Um, and I'm wondering if any of you have a question for each other about any of your projects before we continue. 
think about that while, <laughs> while I prepare the next one. So yeah. there was a really great question, Stephanie, after your um, the presentation that I'd love to sort of pose to you, which was from Joshua Green. And, and you responded to it in the chat a little bit. I'm wondering if you could respond to it um, just a little more uh, uh, publicly for other people who may not have seen that. And the question was, how do, you, how do any of the panelists envision the craft arts community pivoting from addressing the immediate needs to take direct action by creating PPE to critiquing and the instigating change in political and business policies from which this need precipitated? And great that question. I know it's such <laughs> a great question. Yeah, Steph, no. you want to start with that? Sure, sure. Yeah, no, the framing of that was perfect, actually. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually. And, you know, when we get to that point, right, where we can take a step back, finally, because at, at this point, we're still, you know, uh, having a, a kind of first responder um, situation to things. You know, like what are, um, I, what I'm curious about is we've been talking a lot about this notion of mending and fixing. And I'm actually wondering if we can further that word a little bit and, and talk about dismantling. Because, you know, mending and fixing is one thing because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're sort of healing or addressing a wound. But what about the entire structure that created that wound? And so whether, you know, I, the building, the re, uh, reconstitution, the refiguring, because as much as I love healing and mending, I do think that sometimes there's a, uh, this notion of, uh, of it's responding to a situation rather than proactively changing it. That is, that, that's so well put. And somebody mm -hmm. in the comments mentioned, uh, came up with the term dismending, or at least uh, mm -hmm. wrote that in, which I really love. And I think one of the, to just speak to your point, what I'm hearing from a lot of people who do wanna make changes, it's really also grappling with people's anxieties and fears around change too. So it's not just sort of addressing the problem. Karen, do you have any comments about that question or anything you'd like to add? Well, I, I just, I mean, I really, I, I totally agree with Stephanie. I think that it really is the dismantling of, um, of the structure that's built up, that's kind of been built in the air and, and really reforming, really looking at its parts and, and envisioning something something different. I just think that we're really at the stage right now where so much is the dreaming, where we really have to dream, you know, dream very big on many, many different levels to see, you know, how to approach things differently. Because, um, you know, I just think, you know, one of the things in the news being, um, being Pennsylvania and Philadelphia where they're just slashing all the arts funding, you know, on both the state and the city level. And, and that's like inconceivable. And so, you know, and we're gonna see that in a lot of places. And, and so it's really gonna be, you know, the, the act, um, really activating activating populations and popul and making, you know, and really, really forming um, allyships on many, many different levels between the, you know, the home crafters and the, um, the people who have gone to art school and stuff like that, really, really meeting together and figuring out, you know, and, and really seeing each other. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and unfortunately, we're going to wrap up. But Holly, do you have a couple of extra or is there anything you'd like to add to what was just said about that question? Yeah, I think, you know, these, the structure is going to change significantly. And I look at a lot of art organizations that are, are just grappling with what's going on right now. And it's, there's just so many different things. It's like putting out fires all the time it's hard to imagine what it's gonna look like in a couple of years from now. Very true. Um, but I do think that there's a really strong sense of, of a group of people who really wanna make it, um, make it work. And, and I look, at, I'm, I, I think it would be really interesting to historically look back at the WPA and see how something like that could be reinvented and be, you know, sort of deconstruct what we have now and reinvent in a way that that um, provides as 
many different ways to support as many people as possible. And I, I don't even really, I can't even imagine how broad that would have to be to, to help people at this point in time. So um, I love, yeah, I love what Stephanie said before. That was, that was excellent. Thank you. And I just want to sort of echo what uh, Karen said, for those who may not know, but just for this week, and on Hyperallergic, we reported this as well, that the mayor of uh, Philadelphia introduced a bill for next year that actually eliminates all of the $4.4 million allowance for the arts from the city, mm -hmm. and as well as some state funding. So, you know, I think we're still sort of understanding the scope of this. Um, and what's going on. But I wanted to thank Stephanie, Holly, and Karen, um, just because I know these Zoom meetings can be very awkward at first, and particularly for those of us who are not used to sort of being on Zoom all the time. So, I mean, you guys did great, and thank you so much for your insight and expertise. And I just wanna sort of like introduce uh, Sarah Schultz, who's the Executive Director of the American Craft Council, um, just to say some parting words. So, Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you, and I unmuted. So thanks to Harag, Karen, Holly, Stephanie, everybody. Amazing conversation. Um, I have pages and pages of notes that will be distilled. Um, a lot of things to say. This was one thing I do want to add in all of this. Um, we started out by thinking about craft thinking, and one of the things that's always really astounds me about coming from craft practices is to think about the characteristics of makers and those practices actually that keep us whole as individuals and communities and not lose sight of those, those qualities. And I think of what you talked about resourcefulness, adaptation, organizing, visibility, exchange, not just free exchange, not just, not just the offer of labor, but the free exchange of knowledge um, for the betterment of the whole. Um, care and generosity, your own anger and subversiveness um, and a call to action. So, you know, you know, God, I have to say like in these moments, like God bless craft. And then the one last thing I wanna say as we look ahead to the next two forums too, is um, I think what we've seen here is the amazing um, skills and talents and what artists can bring to all of us and the ways perhaps we take that for granted. And I think, you know, I'm all for a WPA, and I would also just remind ourselves that was a federal centralized project. And I think it's really up to all of us and all of the positions of power and um, that we have to really think about what we can do to build those systems and support mechanisms for artists because they need them in order to affect that change. They need support and they need systems that will allow them to, to be visible and do that work. So. I know that those are gonna be future forum conversations. Um, excited to leave my Friday on that, on that cheerleading note. And um, I just wanna say thank you all and thanks to everybody who came. And I hope to see you again in two weeks. Great, thank you, Sarah. Thank you everyone and thank you for joining us. And I hope you'll join us for our next <laughs> um, panel. And uh, you'll all be receiving emails about that, I'm sure. And uh, it was a pleasure to be hosting this. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>